So good morning, everyone. Good morning. So I have to tell you the truth. I told Father John, I was, I, he talked about this, and I said, okay, I'll, I'll preach this Sunday. And again, I did it without looking at the, uh, the lectern. <laughs> I really struggled this week. I read the scriptures, and I, I thought, okay, this is all straightforward. This is Mary and Martha. This is a straightforward story. Why are you struggling so much? And I realized it's because I'm Martha. <laughs> How often have I stood here and preached and said, let's go out and do. Get in the car, let's go do. That's what I preach. That's what I talk about. That's kind of who I am. And then we get Martha and Mary story today. So it's funny how God works, isn't it? You get plopped down with a story and you realize that you have to dig in and pay attention to what's happening, not just in the scripture, but with you. So the readings today, well, it starts with Abraham. And the Abraham story is completely different, gives a completely different message than our gospel today, doesn't it? Completely different message. Or does it? So our, gospel, or our uh, Old Testament reading today is the story of Abraham. Now, most Old Testament biblical scholars, they have a lot of theories about how the first five books, particularly, of the Old Testament work, and where they come from, and where the stories um, are, were written. But most of them agree that there are some primary sources. Um, for Genesis, most of them are called the J source, the E source, and the P source. What, and what that means is that these stories existed long before they were put into writing. And not all the stories necessarily aligned quite right, but they put them together. So when we look at the beginning of Genesis, we hear the story of creation. And there, there are probably two, at least two stories of how creation came into being. Now, the first one is the seven days. Now, most scholars uh, attribute that to the J source, uh, sorry, to the, the P source, the priestly source. That's what it stands for. Now, the priestly theology in the Old Testament, and who knew that there was actually different theologies in the Old Testament, but there are. The P source sees God as something otherworldly, impossible to quite touch, something that is out there. The J source, on the other hand, is something, it stands for Yahweh. Um, the J is silent, obviously. But the J source is about God being present and walking alongside of us. So in the Genesis story, you can see that in the Garden of Eden. Because God walked in the garden with Adam and Eve, right? That came from the P source. So why is this important? Well, it's important for our reading in the Old Testament today. Now, this comes from chapter 18, and we hear Abraham sitting in a tent. Now, this is very clearly from the P source. Why is that? Well, because when he exp explains the, the men that he saw outside of his tent, he says men. He doesn't say messengers. He doesn't say something use another ethereal noun, he talks about men standing outside of, of his tent. Where in chapter 17, just before it, we hear the same telling of the story, but it comes from the J source. And there, or the P source, sorry. The, but there, God is reaching out and giving a direction. But they don't even try to describe what God looks like. It's about... God's something else. But here, in 18, God is ethereal. God is walking with us. And I love this story because it's a little bit funnier than we realize. So Abraham is sitting. Picture this. He's sitting in his tent, and it's really hot outside. And he sees three men standing there. And what does he say? He says, Lord. Lord, Lord. My Lord, if you find favor with me, do not pass by. So when he says, my Lord, 
he recognizes that this is God. He recognizes, and we see that, my Lord, do not pass by. Come in just for a little bread and a little water. God's here. What do I do? <laughs> so what does he do? So come inside for a little bit of bread and a little bit of water, but what does he do? He runs off to Sarah and says, hey, Sarah, God's out front. And so he doesn't just make a little bit of bread. He chooses the finest flour. He goes out and he takes a lamb and asks his slave to prepare that. He prepares a whole feast. He prepares a whole feast for God in the tent. He got to work. But that's not what we heard in our gospel today, is it? That's vastly different than what we heard in our gospel today. Now, today, who here has heard the story of Mary and Martha? Pretty much all of us, right? And how many times have we heard, oh, that poor Martha, she just didn't get it. She was just so busy that she didn't stop to listen to Jesus. But wait a minute. In our Old Testament, that's exactly what Abraham did. Right? He got busy and put a meal in front of God. So what's the difference? Well, first, I think we have to acknowledge Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha, they only appear in two Gospels. They appear in Luke and they appear in John. We see Mary and Martha mentioned a few more times but it's very apparent, not just here, but in other places, that Jesus is comfortable with Mary and Martha. When he enters into their house, he's at home. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, this is a second home for him. Now, in the 13th or 14th century, a pope, I think it was Gregory of something, I don't remember, but he said... This Mary, there's a lot of them out there, <laughs> right? And we know in, in the New Testament, there's a lot of Marys. And so he proceeded to tell us that this was Mary of Magdalene. And so there are quite a bit of confusion out there. But I, I, this is not Mary Magdalene. This is Mary of Bethany. It's different because it's Mary and Margaret. Or Martha. Oh, I said Margaret. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> we'll have to cut that out of the recording. <laughs> so when Jesus sits down, Mary sits at his feet and listens to what he is saying. But Martha was distracted, distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. Jesus, she actually chides Jesus a little bit there, doesn't she? She's given Jesus a little bit of lesson about her doing all the work. This isn't just about her sister. This is her saying to Jesus, I, I got I, I'm, I've got all this stuff to do, and, and you guys are just sitting there and talking? That doesn't seem very fair. But then Jesus says, Martha, oh Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need for only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which I will not take away from her. Now Jesus does not say, there is only one thing, and Mary is doing it. That's not what is said there. Jesus said, there is only one thing. And, and Mary's chosen the better path. So what thing is that? What is that one thing then? That one thing is love. 
And I know we stand up here and preach about love a lot. But that's because I believe it. We believe in a God that so loved us that he sent his only begotten son not just to die for us and to be resurrected for us, but to live for us. We believe in a Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that came to be in relationship with us, that we could understand God more better, more completely. Because God is good. And through God, all things are possible. So then what are these two stories saying to me? Now, Father John often preaches about prayer and what prayer calls us to do. What is prayer? Prayer is if I am praying for you, then I am giving myself over to you. When I am praying for you, I am holding you dear to my heart. And there is something powerful about that. Because if I am giving you over to my, if I'm giving myself over to you, and I'm praying for you, then I will take action for you. And that is love. Brothers and sisters, we are surrounded by some terrible things right now. You can't turn on the news without seeing hate-filled speech. A crisis on the border that is terrible. And if it doesn't break your heart, then you're not paying attention. But it's not just on the border or in other countries. Right here in our own city, in Kansas City, there are racial divides and hate-filled speech happening right here in our city. Yes, we have to pray. And yes, we have to take action. But how do we know which is which? When do I know that the action that I'm taking is right? How do I know that I should be stopping and praying right now? Because I turn on my Facebook, right? When I turn on my Facebook, am I actually making any change when I post something to somebody on Facebook? No. That's about me. That's about me saying, I know better than you. And that's, that's not right. So I, I, I don't always have the answer about when we take action versus when we just stop and pray. But brothers and sisters, I got good news. Today, Jesus is here, present with us. See that table behind me? That altar behind me, Jesus is present in that table. When we take Eucharist, we are kneeling at the feet of Jesus, asking for guidance. Tell me what it is that I need to pray for. Tell me what it is that I need to do. Because Jesus is here now. He didn't just die and was resurrected for us. He lived for us. He lived for us that we could come into deeper relationship with God. So this, this morning, when you come to the Eucharistic table, when you come to that rail and kneel down, or when you come to the standing station, wherever it is that you take communion, kneel down, even if it's only in your heart, and listen. Listen. Amen.